Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Helping homeowners maintain drain, heating, and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Darlene Marco Shiley. And by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Wednesday, January 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. It's been five years since the Chargers left San Diego, but now a local woman is suing over the team's move to Los Angeles. As KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman explains, if, if her lawsuit is successful, the city and taxpayers stand to benefit. Start off and give you a big picture. Former San Diego City Attorney Micah Geary is leading the effort to sue the NFL and its 32 teams, arguing that the league violated its own relocation rules and allowing the Chargers to move to Los Angeles. The actions that they took to give us the impression that they might stay were really not honest. Former Deputy San Diego City Attorney Maria Severson says for more than 50 years, the city spent millions in subsidies and stadium upgrades. But when the Chargers left, it was the NFL who received a more than $600 million relocation payout. The Chargers leave and pay all the other teams, but they don't pay anything to San Diego. Those teams were unjustly enriched. They got something for allowing the Chargers to leave San Diego and the city of San Diego got nothing. This lawsuit seeks to correct that. The lawsuit was filed on behalf of San Diego resident Ruth Henricks, who owns the Huddle Restaurant in Mission Hills. We thank everybody that comes in here. Thank you for supporting us because you're keeping us going. That was from an interview with her in 2020. Henricks' attorneys are confident in their suit. They point to a recent multi-million dollar settlement that the NFL made with the city of St. Louis over the Rams relocation. If St. Louis is good enough to recover $790 million. San Diego is good enough to recover their losses as well. The city of San Diego is not involved in this suit, but San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria and city attorney Mara Elliott issued a statement saying that suing the NFL is a costly and uphill battle, but with taxpayers in line to benefit their hopeful first success. Part of that uphill battle includes liability waivers that were signed by the city in the early 2000s, but attorneys argue that they are not valid anymore because relocation wasn't on the table then. How can you waive something in the future, which you don't know, and bind future city governments? There's a court hearing scheduled for early July. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Something new is planned for Waterfront Park in downtown San Diego. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado tells us there's a lot of excitement about a plan meant to bring more activity to an unused portion of the park. Waterfront Park has received several makeovers over the years. Now, the northeast corner of the park will get its own transformation into a sports park. Today, the County Board of Supervisors got a step closer to making that a reality as they put the project out for construction bids. That motion passes unanimously. We've been working on this for a long time and it's really exciting to, uh, to begin to see it come to fruition and, and ready to start seeing some dirt moving uh, and some stuff get done. So very, very, very excited about that. The plan for the bare one-and-a-half-acre parcel on Pacific Coast Highway and Grape Street is packed with recreational spaces that include basketball and pickleball courts, a t-ball field, table tennis, fitness equipment, and a dog park with agility equipment. During the meeting, Chair Nathan Fletcher said he came up with a plan. People who live here and use the park regularly think this will be a great addition to what the park already offers. Kelly Miller, who was enjoying the park with his new friend Benny, says he's especially looking forward to the dog park. Oh, I think it would be a, a great move for the community. Um, even today, walking around, I see so many dogs out here and uh, people enjoying uh, you know, the, the, the park here, and I could just see that being advantageous for just about anybody that I see down here. Lexi Hutchins says she has a degree in recreation administration with an emphasis on healthy communities. She says this is exactly what the park and community need. There's not a lot of things to do with your friends. Um, so being able to play like bocce ball or pickleball, basketball, it kind of creates a better community around healthy activities. But parents like Ryan Rolera are the most excited. He can't wait to bring little Logan 
been there to run and play when it's all finished. It's hard to find, uh, get my uh, son's attention. We have to keep moving around because he gets bored and all that stuff. So I think it'd be a great place to just take him over here and just, just run, uh, get rid of a lot of his energy. Construction is expected to start this spring and be done by late summer. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. As COVID cases begin to dip in some parts of the country and plateau in others, the question many are asking is, how do we move forward? Pfizer has already announced it is working on a vaccine to target the Omicron variant, but as Daryl Forges reports, the overarching solution could be in a universal coronavirus vaccine. Positive COVID-19 case numbers trending down in some states. According to Johns Hopkins University, the U.S. is averaging over 639,000 new cases per day. That's a 14% decrease over last week. We're two years into this pandemic, and people, I think, are feeling rightly exhausted by all of this. Now, some health experts believe it's time for a change in strategy against the pandemic. We need a new strategy moving forward, and that strategy uh, does not have us in emergency mode all the time. On Wednesday... The Biden administration outlined plans for the future of living with COVID-19 without disruptions to normal life. And we continue to move toward a time when COVID won't disrupt our daily lives, a time when COVID is no longer a crisis, but rather something we protect against and treat. Scientists are working to develop a universal or pan-coronavirus vaccine that offers protection against any type of coronavirus, including variants that cause COVID-19. Obviously, innovative approaches are needed to induce broad and durable protection against coronaviruses that are known and some that are even at this point unknown. Hence, the terminology pan-coronavirus vaccine. As to how long it could take to develop this new vaccine. It's going to take years to develop in an incremental fashion. In the meantime, Dr. Anthony Fauci says the current vaccines and boosters are still the best way to protect yourself. Daryl Forges, KPBS News. 83-year-old Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer will retire. President Biden is expected to formally announce the liberal justice's retirement on Thursday. After Breyer's departure, the oldest member of the Supreme Court will be 73-year-old Justice Clarence Thomas. The court will retain a 6-3 to three conservative advantage. And Breyer's retirement gives President Biden a chance to make good on a, his promise to name the first black woman to the high court. A short list of candidates has been circulating, and a Californian is among them. Leandra Kruger, now 45 years old, was the youngest person to be appointed to the California Supreme Court in 2014. She also worked as a clerk for the late Justice John Paul Stevens. The Federal Reserve is scrambling to combat inflation and market turmoil. Families are feeling the hit to the wallet, paying more for household goods. Isabel Rosales reports on the big announcement from the Fed and how the agency expects it will help. The Federal Reserve moving to bring down inflation in its first meeting of the year. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship. The Fed signaling intentions to raise interest rates by mid-March. Americans are frustrated by the growing cost of goods. You go to the grocery store and you reach for something and you go, my goodness, this is much more than I used to pay for. While many economists anticipate inflation will ease up later this year, nearly 8 in 10 Americans worry it will get worse, according to a new Gallup poll. The typical American family is spending about $250 a month more uh, to buy the same amount of things that they were buying uh, a year ago. Fed officials closely watch these expectations. Fearing high inflation, consumers may speed up purchases and demand higher wages. That change of behavior would make inflation worse. A higher interest rate raises the cost of borrowing on everything from mortgages to credit cards to car loans. The point is to cool down the economy, incentivizing consumers and businesses to save instead. It's been a rough start to 2022 for the markets. Investors have been spooked by international tensions, Omicron, and apprehension over the Fed's decision. In Washington, Isabel Rosales, KPBS News. A local developer has purchased property across the street from the newly opened Claremont Drive trolley station. And KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says they plan on building a lot more housing. 
The three and a half acre site has already been cleared for 156 apartments, along with commercial space and a public plaza. But the site's new owner, Encinitas based development firm Zephyr, is aiming to more than double the density and build 350 apartments. That's great news to Matthew Vasilakis of the nonprofit Climate Action Campaign, which advocates for more transit oriented development. Our region invested $2 billion into a new trolley line that can help us meet our climate action plan goals by getting people closer uh, to that infrastructure uh, and out uh, biking and walking and enjoying a higher quality of life with more economic opportunity. Uh, that's climate safe. So, you know, we really need to capitalize on that. And by building more homes near transit, uh, we're going to be able to uh, meet our climate action plan goals. But the new plans are also likely to spark opposition from neighbors who for years have sought to limit the density and height of development near the new trolley stations. The 11 mile extension of the blue line connects Claremont to UCSD, University City, downtown, the South Bay and the border. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. San Pasqual Academy, the residential and education campus for foster youth in Escondido, was at risk of shutting down this year. But KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne tells us county supervisors approved a plan that secures a future for the foster youth campus. Advocates and supporters of San Pasqual Academy are celebrating after the County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to keep SPA's doors open. This essentially is a big victory being that a year ago, it didn't even seem like we were gonna be able to uh, stay open, keep the academy open uh, past six months. And we did that and then we now have gone to another level of, of ensuring that the academy is open indefinitely. So big day, big victory. Shane Harris with the People's Association of Justice Advocates has helped with the efforts to keep the Foster Youth Campus open. Last year, the state of California informed the facility that their program would come to an end because of a new federal law that discourages funding for congregate living in foster care facilities. The plan approved by the supervisors would transition the academy into a multi-purpose campus for foster youth. Harris says Tuesday's vote is only the beginning of the decision making for the future of SPA. Well, the future of San Pasquale is that it will continue to serve foster youth in the system. Um, but part of the vision that the Board of Supervisors are looking at is obviously the expansion. Although San Pasquale Academy will continue serving foster youth, Harris says SPA staff isn't celebrating just yet. Staff are still probably feeling a little anxious and a little concerned because they work for New Alternatives Incorporated. And if we're talking about the repurposing of now a newly multi-purpose facility, then we're talking about new RFPs, which essentially means that all these people do not have guaranteed jobs. New Alternatives Incorporated has been managing the academy for the last 20 years. Bid supervisors will solicit bids for new management in order to add and expand the services offered at San Pasquale Academy. Services that board chairman Nathan Fletcher says have one goal in mind. Well, to serve more kids in more ways uh, and truly continue a great legacy of what San Pasquale was meant uh, in an enhanced way. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Today, the Navy released new rules for handling COVID-19. The service is leaning heavily on vaccination as it loosens some restrictions. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh says it comes after two years of hard learned lessons. In the opening months of the pandemic, the Navy was caught off guard. In April 2020, it was forced to sideline the USS Roosevelt in Guam to stop a quickly spreading COVID-19 outbreak that infected over a third of the sailors. The head of the Navy, Admiral Michael Gilday, scrambled to get the situation under control. Our goal is to get a clean ship, right? We need about a thousand people or so on that ship to keep those critical functions running, as the secretary mentioned. And so we have uh, people ashore that are isolated that have tested positive. We have others that are, that are quarantined or isolated. One sailor on the aircraft carrier died. The commander was relieved, and the situation became a case study in how not to handle COVID-19. Roosevelt was made much worse, largely by self-inflicted wounds by, by the Navy. So that needs to change. Brad Martin is a retired Navy captain who is now a researcher at Rand Corporation. He says the Navy underestimated the risk of COVID and was slow to react. 
they were befuddled because they were getting a lot of conflicted guidance. They were befuddled because they got uh, because the medical chain of command was telling people one thing. The operational chain of command was telling them something else. Fast forward to early January. The USS Lincoln was about to depart from San Diego. Sailors are required to wear a mask now. The whole crew is vaccinated. Many had boosters. With the carrier as a backdrop, the head of the strike group, Rear Admiral J.T. Anderson, assured reporters that the Navy now has its act together. Frankly, we've learned a lot over the course of the last couple of years, and we feel like we're in a, in a, a good place because we are highly vaccinated. But the Navy has eased up on some of the restrictions that were put in place after the Roosevelt outbreak. Gone are the two weeks of isolation prior to boarding a ship. And the Admiral announced that the crew of 3,000 included sailors who had active COVID cases. We do have some positive cases within the, uh, within the strike group. But again, we're, we're extremely confident that uh, we can safely and effectively execute our mission. The Navy has a 98% vaccination rate, but thousands of sailors have applied for exemptions. So far, the Navy hasn't granted any religious exemptions, though a federal judge has blocked the Navy from taking action against 35 SEALs who are suing on religious grounds. Meanwhile, for the first time in at least a decade, the Marines did recently grant a handful without listing a reason. Vice Admiral Roy Kitchener is in charge of Naval Surface Forces in the Pacific. The way we deal with it now is it's more of an endemic, right, than a pandemic. You know, for me personally, uh, I think it's going to be with us over the next few years, maybe forever. I don't know. Kitchener says no one will deploy without being vaccinated. Ships are doing contact tracing on board. And mirroring the Center for Disease Control guidelines, six sailors are spending five days in isolation instead of 10. There is no magic to getting them out quicker. There's just more tools to manage it. And that's really the key thing we look at. Do you have enough people you know, that can operate that ship safely? Martin says the Navy has made progress in keeping sailors healthy. Still, he says a lot of effort went into keeping ships at sea. Maybe, he says, a better answer was keeping the ships at home rather than sending them on non-essential missions. The Navy needs to think seriously about what's really a definite must-do deployment and what's something that can wait. What's something that is, may not even be necessary for any ship to be someplace for some period of time. Nobody's going to notice, nobody's going to care, and... Uh, creating all kinds of havoc in order to try to meet a commitment may not be necessary. And he says the Navy still has trouble anticipating crises instead of learning from its failures. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. That persistent offshore flow is going to continue here over the next couple of days. And we're also keeping an eye on the possibility of some strong Santa Ana winds to close out the work week. But with that means warmer temperatures and also some bright afternoons in the forecast. For tonight, temperature is getting down into the mid-40s for you in the metro under mainly clear skies. Uh, elsewhere, we're looking at 38 for you in Escondido, 42 in Borrego Springs, 35 out towards Mount Laguna. Thursday, the ridge builds on in. It's a sunny, pleasant day here. No complaints for us on our Thursday as highs get up into the upper 60s in Chula Vista. El Cajon, 73 for your daytime highs, 68 out towards Oceanside and into San Diego, 71 for you in Borrego Springs. And then again, here is that area of high pressure really strengthening, sending those offshore winds into central and southern uh, California. And that could bring in some warmer temperatures, but also that risk of wildfire danger to close out the work week. Near the coast, temps go from the upper 60s on Thursday into the mid 70s on Friday. Hold on to the 70 degree mark there Saturday and after that we should drop off back down to the 60s because we're going to be watching as a trough digs southward early next week and that brings in some cooler air. Further inland, temperatures looking to stay in the low 70s for you from Thursday all the way through Sunday and then again start and feel the impacts of that trough as temperatures begin to cool off on Monday but I think much more significant 
sticky and cool down Tuesday and Wednesday. In the mountains, temperatures really not changing a whole lot here over the next couple of days. Could be in the mid to upper 40s, maybe even getting up into the low 50s Monday before a cool down arrives there again Tuesday into Wednesday. And in the deserts, temps here looking to stay in the upper 60s to low 70s from Thursday through Saturday. Maybe a brief bump into the upper 70s Sunday and then starting that downward trend too. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. We saw millions of them in the 1980s, then less than 2,000 of them last year. But it looks like the Western monarch butterflies are on a rebound to more than 247,000. The Western monarch Thanksgiving count is taken annually, and it shows the highest number of butterflies in five years, but still far less than the numbers that we saw four decades ago. Last year's count was the smallest ever seen since 1997, with a loss of more than 95% of the population. Population. The American Lung Association is giving the federal government failing grades over tobacco use. The state of tobacco control report gave the government a D for regulating products and an F for taxes. The organization is asking the FDA to finalize proposals that would end the sale of flavored cig cigars and menthol cigarettes by April. Meanwhile, California lawmakers are introducing a bill to ban single-use filters on cigarettes. Reporter Valena Jones explains. I'm trying to keep Auburn beautiful. Sally Dolly, better known as the Auburn Butt Lady, has spent eight years picking up cigarette butts littered on the ground. Ten different days since I've started. I have picked up over 3,000 butts in one day. The burned butts are not only a concern for the environment to Sally, but to animals as well. I want to walk up to smokers and smack them with my broom. It's like, come on, people. These things are poison. Dogs will eat them. A new bill is looking to solve that problem, banning single-use filters on cigarettes. An idea long-term smoker Dave Gunn says he could get behind. Well, I think it'd be a good thing for the environment, yeah. Um, it, it would force the tobacco companies to come out with a better cigarette. I think everything is a filter right here if you look up there. The owner of Auburn Smoke Shop fears if passed, the proposed law would cripple his business with 99% of his customers buying filtered products. Well, I don't think anybody could be in the business then, you know. If that's going to happen. In a press conference Tuesday, Assemblymember Mark Stone, who introduced the bill, responded to pushback on health concerns of unfiltered cigarettes. Because of the way smokers draw from cigarettes, filterless and filtered, that with the filter on the cigarette, they're getting different types of cancers and potentially more aggressive types of cancers. So which is less dangerous? There's a study highlighted in the National Center for Biotechnology Information claims a filtered cigarette is less harmful because of reduced toxicity of inhaled smoke. A proposed smoking solution, Sally hopes, will force her to get a new hobby. It's really important. I mean, why have this poisonous stuff out there? I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer plans to step down, setting up a battle over his replacement. That's coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Many of the world's best golfers are here in San Diego for the Farmers Insurance Open. Players like Phil Mickelson and Jason Day are teeing off at Torrey Pines over the next few days. About 100 people were lined up early this morning as fans were welcomed back to the course for the first time in two years. It's my first ever golf tournament playing or watching and there's going to be some really exciting players to watch and I just wanted to like be the first ones to watch them. It's kind of, you know, when you're going to Disneyland, it's that feeling like, oh yes, I'm so excited and you don't know what's going to happen today. And this is the first year of a Wednesday through Saturday schedule instead of the typical Thursday through Sunday to avoid conflicts with the NFL playoffs. Masks and vaccines are not required. The tournament worked with the county to follow all guidelines for outdoor events, and they say there's plenty of room for people to distance and feel comfortable. The movie industry was optimistic in late 2021, and then came Omicron. David Daniel looks at how the latest coronavirus variant is affecting what movies are landing in theaters and who's going to see them. You're flying out into the darkness to fight ghosts. Spider-Man No Way Home has set box office records, but it's been the exception. After a brief resurgence, most moviegoers are once again staying home.
We're still on that road to recovery. Box office for January of 2022 is down about 60% from January of 2020, and that was pre-pandemic. Box office expert Paul Dergarabedian says movie studios are also still on edge about the pandemic. This weekend, no new movies are opening in wide release. Studios are still moving films down calendar, and that's why we're seeing such a quiet first month of the year and maybe into February until the Batman arrives in March. I don't care what happens to me. It's only going to get worse for you. It's no coincidence that studios are banking on the bat, the cat, and the spider as coronavirus cases rise again. Garabedian says the Omicron surge has intensified recent demographic shifts in moviegoing. It's the more mature moviegoer that's been much more reticent to go out to theaters, Adult dramas, films aimed at people, let's say, over 40 years of age, have really not done that well. That means critical favorites aimed at older audiences like King Richard and Belfast likely won't get the hoped-for Oscar bump when nominations are announced in early February, as audiences remain cautious. Be good, Tom. If you can't be good, be, be careful. careful. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. And here is a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on Morning Edition. A new approach to reaching out to people experiencing homelessness. How Caltrans is partnering with the city of San Diego. And then on Midday Edition, how students can get money for college while giving back to their community. Details on the new California College's core program. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you.